Hello friends, this is Dr. Ashish Taneja and today I will, dis I will discuss with you TKR in valgus knee. TKR in valgus knee is not done very often, it's not talked about very often. That's why it's always uh, not very comfortable for us uh, to talk about or to do. So what I will try to do here is I'll try to make you comfortable with uh, valgus knee TKR by discussing and elaborating on basic principles here. So what is the etiology of valgus knee? It can be due to primary osteoarthritis, inflammatory arthritis as in rheumatoid disease. It can be because of post-traumatic arthritis as a result of tibial malunion, physial arrest in childhood or a tibial plateau fracture. It can be because of overcorrection of a high tibial osteotomy. We reversed from a varus knee to a valgus knee. Or it can be an unresolved physiological valgus deformed knee. It can also be secondary to metabolic conditions like rickets or renal osteodystrophy. So in a valgus deformity, it can be because of two things. It, ha it, it can have a bony component or and a soft tissue component that is the ligamentous pathology. Amongst the bony defect, a valgus deformity can have a lateral cartilage erosion. It can have a lateral femoral condylar hyperplasia. It can also have a lateral tibial plateau deficiency. So if you see the diagram here, it can have a hypoplastic lateral femoral condyle and a cartilage erosion right here. It can have a lateral tibial plateau deficiency right here. There can also be an external rotation deformity of the tibia. It's commonly seen in severe deformities. If these deformities exist and become severe, they can finally lead to a metaphyseal femur and tibial plateau remodeling. Now you can understand that if we have a hypoplasia of the lateral femoral condyle, it can affect the trochlea as well. If you can see right here. If the trochlea is blunted, it can lead to patellofemoral subluxation problems. So all these are the bony problems of a valgus deformity. Going further, what are the soft tissue components of a valgus deformity? As we understand, it will have a contracted structures on the lateral side and a elong elongated structure on the medial side. Amongst the contracted structures, it can be a iliotibial band, which is seen right here. Iliotibial band right here. Okay. It can have a, ta a tight lateral collateral ligament, which is seen right here. There can be a tight popliteus tendon, which is seen just adjacent to the lateral collateral ligament. There can be a tight postlateral capsule. Rarely, the lateral head of gastronemius and the long head of biceps can also be affected. Same, uh, similarly, on the other side, on the medial side, the stabilizing structures will be elongated, especially the MCL, which, be, which will be attenuated and elongated. This is not seen in various deformity. In a valgus deformity, the medial side is elongated and attenuated. With a bis, in a varus deformity, the lateral side is not elongated. So once we have a case of uh, valgus knee, we would like to further evaluate it by doing x-rays. In x-rays, we do the whole series of x-rays, including a weight-bearing AP, lateral, long length standing, Rosenberg, and a merchant view. In case the deformities are correctable, it will be recommended that we do stress views as well to see what is the flexible component or correctable component of the deformity. We should document what is the correctable component and how much is the fixed component of a deformity. That will help us in correction during surgery as well. So these are the routine x-rays that we get for all the patients of a valgus knee including a long leg standing view, a AP standing view, a lateral view and a skyline view. What do we see in these x-rays? We should see amount of bone stock available to us. We should see 
the lateral distal femoral hypoplasia. We should focus around this region. We should see for the lateral femoral condylar hypoplasia. We should also see for any posterior condylar erosion right here. And in severe cases, we should look for a metaphysial remodeling of proximal tibia and distal femur. In severe cases also, there may be subluxation of patellofemoral joint, which will be seen on the skyline view. So now we have a patient with valgus knee who needs surgery, who needs TKR. So before we proceed for surgery, we should template and plan on the x-rays. For templating and planning, we just need two views, AP and lateral view. On the lateral view, we will size the femoral and tibial component. We should make sure that we make a note of amount of posterior condylar offset and the inherent tibial slope. This has to be reproduced in the surgery so that the numbers are same in the post-operative x-ray as well. We should look for any posterior osteophytes as well. They should be removed during surgery carefully. On the AP view, we confirm the size of both tibia and femoral component and check for any overhang. If there is any overhang, then we should co consider downsizing the component. We should also see the amount of resection of tibia that we have to plan and the amount of valgus correction angle. So these all things have to be planned before surgery. Now before we proceed for surgical steps, we should understand about normal alignment so that we can uh, understand how do we plan our bone cuts. So what is normal alignment? Mechanical axis is the axis of line or the line of weight bearing through the bone. When the bone is straight like tibia, mechanical and anatomical axis are the same. However, in femur they are different. The mechanical axis is about 7 degrees, 5 to 7 degrees valgus to anatomical axis. So if you see here, the anatomical axis is the line passing through center of the bone from tip of trochanter to the tip of intercondylar notch and the mechanical axis is the line starting from center of head of femur till the head till the apex of intercondylar notch between the two the angle is about 6 degrees or 5 to 7 degrees so what is normal mechanical axis of the lower limb also known as mechanical axis of the knee it is defined as the line that passes from center of hip right here to the center of ankle right here in a patient with normal knee alignment, this line should pass through center of the knee right here. So this is a normal alignment and in this case, the mechanical axis of the limb is passing through center of the knee. Going further, what is femoral mechanical axis? Femoral mechanical axis runs from head of the femur to intercondylar notch of distal femur. In this case, this is marked with green. So this line here is the mechanical axis of the femur. What is tibial mechanical axis? Tibial mechanical axis extends from center of the proximal tibia to center of the ankle, which is same as anatomical axis. Now we should define hip, knee, ankle, angle. So this angle is the angle made between the mechanical axis of femur and mechanical axis of tibia. It's the medial angle. It represents the overall alignment of lower extremity and usually less than 180 degrees in normal knees. So you can say the hip knee ankle angle is almost 180 degrees in a normal alignment. This will vary in valgus or varus knee. So in the valgus knee, the, the hip knee ankle angle will be like this. This is the mechanical axis of femur, this is the mechanical axis of tibia. So this angle will change. Similarly, the hip, knee, ankle angle will change in various deformity as well. The angle will be made by mechanical axis of the femur and mechanical axis of the tibia. That's how it will change. Going further, we normally measure alignment either by 
the hip knee ankle angle which is the mechanical tibiofemoral angle normally it's about 1.3 degrees of varus or we can also use anatomical tibiofemoral angle which is 6 degrees of valgus plus minus 2 degrees so this is a normal knee joint alignment we'll use this as a basic uh, measurement for a knee joint alignment